Finally, finally the time has come. The comedy event of the year finally arrived. It's been six long years since we got a brand new hour of material from comedy's most valiant defender, the great and powerful Joe Rogan. Every era of comedy has its greats, guys. And you may not like it, but Joe is inarguably one of the greats now. He is the biggest and most successful comic on earth, and the valiant leader of the highly endangered 250 comics. In case you don't know what I'm talking about and have had your head planted firmly in the sand for the past six years, there are only 250 comics left in the entire world. Because yeah. there's so few of us. And worldwide, we were talking about this the other day, there's maybe 500 of us on the planet. You know, you got to be real generous and say 500 because it's really probably about 250. Whoa. Right. But like legit comics, guys you want to hang out with, guys who are fun. Please say you want to hang out with me. And the future looks grim for the 250, sadly. Only a couple years ago, there were still 2,000 of them, which isn't a lot, but still. They're dwindling fast, suffering many, many casualties. But Joe's doing his best to protect them, which is admirable, considering he's the greatest stand-up comedian of our time. As you can see, he's earned his spot amongst heroes like Robin Williams, Richard Pryor, Bill Hicks, all these guys. And maybe you disagree, but we have no objective way to measure the quality of a comic other than by their revenue. I have what you call fuck you money. So this multimillionaire is by far the best of the best. My parents had George Carlin and Richard Pryor. My grandparents had acts like the Marx Brothers, Red Skelton, and Al Jolson. And we, we are truly blessed because we get to exist on this planet at the same time as guys like Andrew Schultz. Now that right there was a seamless transition into an ad if I've ever seen one before. Flawless perfection and you deserve it, but so does betonline.ag. Bert Kreischer. Tony Hinchcliffe. Hello, I'm Tony Hinchcliffe. Come check out Kill Tony tonight. Watch me do magical stuff like that. Nailed it. And of course, their comedy father, who keeps them all well fed like little birdies in a nest, Joe Rogan. Thank him. This thing was shot in San Antonio, Texas, where those few brave warriors once defended the Alamo in that big battle. It's a lot like the 250 defenders of comedy. Against all odds, they prevailed. And thank Christ they did, because otherwise we would never have been blessed with this wonderful comedy special, Burn the Boats. Now it's been six years since our man Joe released a stand-up special. The last one was back in 2018, Strange Times, which again is definitely one of the greats, as you can see here on this wall that you can find inside Joe's Comedy Club. The Comedy Mothership. It's been so long. It's hard to believe he took six years to write an hour of comedy, but you know Joe. He has to get in there and hammer away at these jokes, finely honed like Damascus steel. I'm always interested in the, in the writing process. Yeah, why, what is yours? You just go, right? Like I can type, so I don't have to look at the keys, which is nice. Oh, wow. I don't type great, but I, I type okay. Enough. As you're writing each yeah. individual word, you're pausing in time. Yeah. And you're like, you're in a time lapse and you get to consider each and every possible way you would say something from that word yeah. while you're writing that word. Yeah. And there's a physical task of doing that with your keys and your <laughs> fingers that makes you concentrate yes. because it fires up your synapses and yeah. makes you think that you're doing this with your fingers. Mm. It's kind of exciting. Yeah. yeah. You can't just shit out a bunch of jokes and expect them to be any good. Yeah. Joe is a man of quality, so six years it is. Will somebody please shoot me? It took Michelangelo four years to complete the painting of the Sistine Chapel ceiling. And it's pretty good, I guess, but imagine if he had spent two more years on it. Imagine how much better it could be. Guys, I've said it before and I'll say it again because nobody ever seems to fucking listen to me, but quality takes time. Like dry-aged ribeyes or a dram of that wonderful Laphroaig whiskey. If you have a triple-digit IQ, you'll be able to wait patiently, knowing that despite the difficulty in waiting, the results will be worthwhile in the end. Now, a lot has happened in the life of Joe Rogan over the past six years. It's been arguably the most dramatic six years of his life. Since 2019, he has found himself in some hot water many, many times. Troubling video sparking the uproar went viral over the weekend, and we should warn you, it's difficult to watch. And to help cope with the adversity he's had to face, he's redesigned his entire personality. 
becoming a brand new guy, which is commendable. Twitter, right. Texas went red, bitch! There you go. See, that's, that's but with this new guy that he's become, he's also attracted millions and millions of new fans thanks to his wonderful podcast. And apparently, despite it being Joe's justification for existing, a lot of these people aren't even aware that Joe does stand-up comedy. In the lead-up to this special, Joe shared a few promotional posts advertising the event, and a lot of the commenters, sorry, the haters, I should say, well, they had a lot to say about the quality of Joe's comedy act. And uh, many of the rest were just confused why this guy was suddenly doing a stand-up special out of nowhere, which is pretty interesting. You hate to see it, but maybe it's just because he's been away so long. Uh, maybe they just forgot. I mean, we haven't seen Michael Jordan dunk a basketball in over 20 years. And even with him, it's easy to forget how good he was. So I can understand forgetting how funny our king really is, but that's no excuse to be rude. Maybe. I'm afraid some of this animosity was getting to Joe, who admits he is so fragile that he can't even watch his own specials, which isn't exactly a great way to improve your routine, but what do I know? He looked incredibly nervous and without confidence as he promoted this thing on his podcast leading up to it. Okay. I have to announce, because uh, Netflix is making me announce this, that I have uh, a Netflix special that's live Saturday night from San Antonio. Oh. So it's going to be live all over the world. I've seen your set. It's really funny. It's, uh, it's tight now. Mm. It's uh. good. It's like I'm very happy with it. How long has it been since you dropped the special? Six years. Wait, do seriously? Yeah, I was ready to do one in August of 2020. Then I just started changing a lot of bits and moving stuff around. And I'm like, I don't want to do one right now. But not everyone was negative about it. Some comedy fans were thrilled and chomping at the bit to be part of a wonderful live comedy experience from the comfort of their very own homes. Thank you, Netflix, for all you've done for comedy. I have prepared for this probably more than anything I have maybe in my life, but definitely in recent memory. Uh, I've been going at it hard. Okay, well, sounds like Joe is ready, and I am too, so let's prepare to laugh. Take notes, liberals. This is Joe. Wow, and there he is, wearing a very beautiful, delicate, flowing mustard blouse. He looks gorgeous. Ah, and there's the stool. God, that's exciting to see. I hope he utilizes that stool tonight. He has to, right? Chekhov's stool. I've been living here for four years. I fucking love it. I love it here. Okay, well, right off the bat, he's still, uh, he does seem a little nervous still, and he's screaming at the top of his lungs. I want to sell kayaks! Now, I'm not sure if he's confused or what, but he's shouting full blast the same way he does when he's doing commentary for UFC events, when he's surrounded by an arena full of thousands of screaming fans. Maybe he's been doing too much UFC, not enough stand-up, and his wires got all bungled up there, and he forgot which gig he was at. Never moving. The only, the only adjustment I've ever Oh, wait, okay, there he goes. It's Texas Weed. Suddenly it all clicked, and he remembered this is a comedy show. The audience is quiet, and there's no need to shout the whole time. Great. Texas Weed is different. Ah, uh, yeah, that's better. Good job, Joe. You can do it. You got this. Texas Weed is grown on Texas soil. Now, almost right off the bat, Joe goes into tackling the topic of weed. Now, weed, if you don't know, is a serious crime in Texas, the land of the free. If you get caught with that stuff, they literally lock you up in a prison with scary criminal murder guys, mutilators, violators, all those types. But lucky for Joe, he got around this issue by simply becoming friends with their wheelchair governor guy called Greg. What a lucky guy. So there's some advice for my fellow partakers down in Texas. Just get in with this guy, jiggle his flaccid dangler, and you'll get the green light to bun to your heart's content. It's actually really easy. So Joe is sticking to his tried and true handful of topics. He mentioned weed. And here he gets onto the topic of aliens again, one of Joe's favorite subjects. I'm very invested in aliens being real. If they're not, I'm going to feel so fucking stupid. Yeah, Joe is definitely going to feel real stupid if aliens are proven to be fake. Say what you want about Joe, but when he's proven wrong, even though he might feel a bit dumb, he takes it in stride and learns from his mistakes. But the State of the Union was not live, and... Yes, it was. No. No, did you see that they found out that it wasn't? Someone zoomed in on his watch, and his watch was the wrong time. Whoa. Uh, how could that even be? I don't know what they knew. How do you know what they knew? You just, you, you get a feed. You know? I don't think all the Republicans would agree to it, too. Who knows they're all what there. they knew? They're all there live? Yeah. What he's doing it? Let's see... 
I don't see anything. State of the Union wasn't live. I added watch. It could be some troll shit. See anything about they that. got me. Yeah. Look at Biden's watch, incorrect time, State of the Union. Yeah, there is a fake image. They got me, these sons of bitches. It's just amazing how much stuff is fake. It's just like that stuff. Like, who's doing that stuff and why are they doing that stuff? They could probably be putting up some of that misinformation themselves. Attaboy, Joe. How can anyone not like him? People go, if aliens are real, why don't they just land on the White House lawn? Oh, well, when you go fishing, do you check in with the president of the lake? Mm. Now, I hate to fact check already, but there is no president of the lake. There are fish and bugs and ducks and things, and there may even be a mayor of a nearby township, but no president. So this analogy is terrible, and I don't know, guys, I... This is... Look, I, I've been trying to be positive about this thing, but there have already been several red flags that Joe's heart is not in this comedy thing anymore, and... No! No, no. No. Sorry, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna stay positive here, stay prepared to laugh. Continue. What the fuck just happened? Holy shit, where have I seen that face before? Let me dig into the files here, I think I know. Oh my god, it's him. I think aliens look at us the same way we look at Waffle House fights. Now we all know Joe has never been inside a Waffle House, so how does he know about Waffle House fights? From social media, of course, Joe is a rabid user of social media. Especially Twitter. And despite being a detached millionaire who mostly hangs out with the retired Navy SEAL security guards he keeps around him at all times, there are many, many accounts Joe follows that allow him to keep his finger on the pulse of the quote, real world, like these ones. I call this genre of account Poverty Safari. There are many of them that let you vicariously explore things like the hoods of Detroit or the homeless camps of LA. The problem with Joe is that this is all he looks at, all the time and he has constructed inside his mind a very distorted model of the world around him, which he never actually sees in real life. It's a lot like Plato's cave. If you've got a triple-digit IQ, you already know what that's about. But if not, Plato's cave is an allegory, look it up, for the way our brains interpret data from our senses and construct a model of reality that informs the way we think, feel, and behave. In the story, it's explained that we all resemble captives who are chained deep within a cavern, and who do not yet realize that there is more to reality than the shadows they see against the wall. So Joe's social media feed is his cave, and the first evidence of that is seen here with this Waffle House remark. Okay, now before we look at this next clip, I just want to prepare you. You may be confused, but don't worry. President Joe Biden is not suddenly collaborating with Rogan on this special. This is actually an impression Joe has been working on for five or six years, and he's finally ready to unveil it. Joe isn't known for doing good impressions, so this is very brave to try and do live here. Let's be nice. I got hairy legs. My uncle got eaten by a cannibal. Incredible. See, guys, six years. Come on, man. Six years. Six years. Well, with a few of his regular subjects out of the way, Joe veers into a topic that's going to permeate a lot of this special. Ass play. I don't want to sound like a broken record as we've spoken before about Carl Jung and the shadow self, so just to make it quick. We all have an inner shadow self inside our psyches that contains all the hidden aspects of our personalities. The self's emotional blind spot. The part of you that your ego does not want to acknowledge. All the things we do not wish to be. But to become a fully actualized person, those aspects need to be assimilated somehow. And if not assimilated, the repressed shadow will find all sorts of ways to leak out subconsciously. And as you'll see in this bit, whether he wants to do this or not, Joe's obsession with ass play gets put front and center. So here we're about to see some clear shadow leakage as Joe graphically describes the unbridled pleasure of anal probing. Imagine if you have your greatest orgasm ever on an operating table on a spaceship. Oh, Jesus! Make him just chiz all over himself. Just, oh, Jesus! Oh, God! Greatest orgasm ever, he says. Well, that may be so, but Joe, you don't need to wrap that admission up inside a story about aliens. It's not a surprise, guys, if you've been studying Joe Rogan as long as I have. You'll remember the time he publicly opined on how great it would be to become a woman and get fucked by some guy. I know you well enough to know. You, Joe Rogan, if there was a technology that could instantly turn you into a woman, yeah. you wouldn't hesitate to turn into a woman. I'd like to feel a dick inside me. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Me as a woman? Yeah. and I, I, I don't think it made me gay. What happens is you become a woman who actually feels the way a woman feels when she's attracted Signed. to a man. And a guy with a dick, dick, dick like a battering ram. 
Let me try. This is going to send it home. See what happens. And you can't wait. You want to feel him come inside your upper rib cavity. Like, I want to uh, feel it. Uh, uh, uh. Sign me up. The point yeah, but, is, like, you would do it. some men, the weakest among us, would be scared of that experience. Right. Well, They'd be scared that that experience weakens them and turns them into something that they, they, they dismiss. I would, I would like to feel what it's like to be pregnant. Really? Yeah. I wonder if, if amyl nitrate does that. Like, that's the reason why uh, gay guys like poppers. Mm -hmm. It's because it, it relaxes your asshole muscles. Is that true? Or you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's hmm. part of, it's like a feeling of euphoria and also relaxing your asshole muscles. Or how he enjoys engaging in oral sex with a penis from time to time. Yeah, Zach, I can suck my own dick if I wanted to. No, you no, can't. You, can not. Super flex. you can't. No, yes. you can't. Far. You know I can. Okay, that's just some context for you as we examine this next sequence. That's how they get come out of donkeys. Oof. Okay. Unfortunately, now it sounds like the crowd's initial excitement and enthusiasm is running on fumes as we've got our first real obvious awkward bomb of the night. The crowd goes completely silent and Joe just stands there like a deer in headlights. But Joe manages to salvage it by stooping to the lowest form of conversation. Remember when? I used to host Fear Factor. And, uh, <laughs> and oh, yeah. Thank you very much, thank you very much. And now, I don't know if this is from excitement and arousal or from nervousness and fear, likely some combination of both. Buckets of cum. But this is the moment Joe starts profusely sweating through the mustard blouse. Perhaps it's nerves from some subconscious realization that his shadow is about to take the wheel and squirt out a major leak here. Pay attention to this region here and watch how it develops throughout the show. And by the way, oh, oh man, look at that stool behind him just teasing us back there. Stop teasing us, Joe. He knows how to build suspense, that's for sure. Ah man, we are only five minutes into this thing and I am just dying for some stool work. We'll have to settle for some ass work for now, I guess. You take a cattle prod and you stick it up the donkey's ass and you shock his prostate and they just bust. And then I was like, what does that feel like? What if it's your favorite thing? Like, There's ah! that leakage. You can't even tell anybody. It's too bad for Joe. He's too old and his brain is far too calcified to become a new guy in this aspect of his life. It's too deeply rooted. But someone should tell Joe that it's okay to just enjoy that stuff. It's no big deal anymore, Joe. Ass play has gone mainstream. Don't worry about it. Should we keep hammering? Hmm? Should we keep hammering? Keep hammering? What's that? But instead he settles for keeping it a secret while releasing a little shadow pressure by revealing his deepest desires live on Netflix for millions of people under the guise of donkeys and aliens. It works for now, but it's not a viable long-term strategy. Now, and I can't believe this, but he's going to bail on his set and we know he's bailing because Joe has said for years that once he's done a joke on a special, he retires it and never does it again. So here he's really starting to bomb and is so terrified that he's going to break his own code and fall back into some tried and true material. He is going to Mencia himself here and regurgitate a bit from his 2009 special, Talking Monkeys in Space. And I'm watching porn on the computer. My girlfriend just opens up the door. You did it while I'm at home. She was really sad about that. I didn't have the heart to tell her, I do it while you're sleeping right next to me. She goes, I can't believe you did it while I'm at home. And I'm like, I do it while you're sleeping right next to me. Oh man, that's a finely aged 15 year old classic bit. I'm a little surprised that Rogan broke his code here, but our behavior can change dramatically when faced with an existential crisis like bombing this bad. For example, when people are in the midst of drowning and someone jumps in to save them, the drowner often ends up inadvertently and tragically murdering their rescuer amid the struggle to save themselves. You do what you gotta do, and I guess when you bomb hard enough, you do what you gotta do to survive too. But unfortunately, that can often be self-defeating. Here's the thing about jerking off. Everybody does it, but if you get caught, you're a fucking loser. Uh-oh, this actually sounds like a cope. I don't know if I ever told you guys this, but I grew up without an uncle, and that has gifted me with the ability to detect copes. And this has to be a cope. This is way too personal. You're a fucking loser. And by the way, not to nitpick, but have you noticed that this is Joe's new default face? Does this look like the face of somebody who's enjoying what they're doing? To me, this face confirms that his heart is not in this anymore, and I just don't get it. Like, why is he still trying to do stand-up? What's the point? I can't keep doing this! And man, the sweat stain is evolving rapidly. He's very nervous, and judging by the way he can't stop screaming, He's likely hopped up on stimulants and booze. 
Joe forgot to mention that also during COVID, he became a bloated alcoholic. Oh, is somehow or another better than Joe? Oh, Joe's. God damn it. I'm sorry. I, I got to stay positive. Joe, you're doing great. <laughs> is it? A Joe then goes into a little story about going through airport security high on mushrooms and how wacky that was before swiftly pivoting right into his other passion, the trans. Men get pregnant. I'm willing to say pregnant men. If, if just, I just don't think it's a good, I think you need extra words. Maybe we should use extra words. Oh no, there's that silence again. Hearing more and more of that as the audience grows weary. Trans women are women. How about most? <laughs> How about almost all? You gotta leave room for crazy. Just jokes, folks. You know when they put this line in the trailer for this thing, I thought he must have said something truly edgy. But now I'm seeing it is actually a massive cope uttered during a major bombing. Just jokes, folks. No one's getting hurt. Notice that sniff there? That is one of Joe's tells. He does it on the podcast all the time. It's a nervous tick that comes out when he feels awkward about something embarrassing he just said. We all have our tells and ticks, guys. Mine used to be that I'd look to the side. But I got over it and am back on the straight and narrow. You disrespectful motherfucker. Oh, wait. Oh, my God. Yes, he's approaching the stool. Here we go. Yes. Now's his chance to win him back. No, uh... Damn it, just another tease. And by the way, why didn't Joe film this in his comedy spaceship? That's too bad. I'm surprised he wouldn't want to give the place some easy advertising. Joe is normally very prolific with his advertising work, often able to squeeze several dozen ads into one podcast episode. I opened up a comedy club in Austin, Texas. Oh, the year and a half. I knew it. There's the ad. But did you catch the sniff? Thank you very much. Yes, he's a little ashamed to be doing this, but Joe is the king of slipping ads in everywhere, sometimes without you even noticing. And here he goes shamelessly promoting his club, disguising it as a joke. I opened up a comedy club in Austin, Texas a year and a half ago. This is a comedy pop-up ad, it's spam. It wasn't necessary, just a real life pop-up ad. Suddenly every man in a dress is stunning and brave. Okay, great, I was worried he wasn't going to get back to the trans, oh the trans. You can walk through the women's locker room with a hard cock and anybody who complains is a Nazi. Seriously though, these aren't really jokes. This is all just his regular podcast banter he's been doing for the past five years, just yelled on a stage in front of an audience. And the bombs are piling up, that sweat stain is growing, and it is a sad thing. I'm sorry guys, I tried to be positive, but there is such a thing as toxic positivity. And I gotta say, this special is terrible and beyond salvaging, possibly career ending. You can't just put lipstick on, now you can shit in the women's room. Like, oh my god, all, all of a sudden it's a hate rally. Yeah, actually, it kinda is. Doesn't help that this guy looks exactly like Mussolini. I'm not prejudiced. I think it's China. I think, I think they got us with TikTok. Craziest thing is they make our phones. That's, we're suppo that's supposed to be our enemy, and they make our phones. Do you know how dumb that is? I just want to say, honestly, I admire what they've done. A lot of people miss this, but the Joe Rogan Spotify deal was in part financed by the Chinese Communist Party. Spotify is owned in part by Tencent, whose CEO, Pony Ma, has openly vowed to uphold the goals and desires of the CCP. So it's odd that Joe would complain about this TikTok China stuff because he is most likely, whether he realizes it or not, a weapon of propaganda used by the Chinese government to sow chaos in America. All you gotta do is follow the money. That's the one good thing I learned from Joe's podcast. And now something starts to happen that, and I can't believe I'm even saying this, but Joe actually goes full Brendan Schaub with this wonderful Chinese voice he does here. I go! Look, there's Harry! Mr. Schaub, after you numb your lip, you need many, many stitches. This be worth paying your life. With all these big criticisms about our infrastructure! Well, that is rough, but at least he's not straight up copying Brendan's jokes, right? My life would be so much easier if I was just gay as shit. <laughs> I wish I was gay. It looks way easier. We'd like play video games all day. We'd work out. At night, we'd fuck each other. <laughs> You're hanging out with only guys. No one can get pregnant. That is a low that is so low where I never expected Joe to go. Stealing from Brendan Schaub. My God, if that is not the death knell of a comedy career, then I don't know what is. Brendan Schaub quit comedy after releasing that special, and it only stands to reason that if Joe is stealing from it, then he ought to do the same. It like a cop went into a Ugh, he just won't stop screaming. Playing sports. This joke doesn't need to be yelled. If everything is yelled, then you can't emphasize anything. So this whole thing just kind of becomes white noise. It all just flows and blends together meaninglessly. It's stimulating but meaningless, which is basically what his podcast is, a screensaver for the brains of failed warehouse forklift operators. 
sat at home chewing on oxys and collecting pogi. All right, what else did Danny Benito say here? If you're getting your vaccine advice from me. Oh, great. Is that really my fault? Next, he goes into his routine of, I'm just a shithead comedian, don't take me seriously. I'm a professional shit talker, okay? Don't take my advice. This special is just PR now, this is not comedy. He knows nobody normal listens to his show anymore, so he can't reach them on his podcast. But normies watch Netflix, and a lot of them are going to be checking out what that guy whose podcast they can't believe they used to listen to and have to try and remember to whom they admitted listening to it and cringe with pure embarrassment about that. They, yeah, they want to see what that guy's up to. So this is Joe's chance to get some good damage control in. They tried to use that quote as proof that I'm homophobic. First of all, it's not true, but if He's literally know, just reenacting one of his many Instagram apology soliloquies. And it is just so fucking tedious to listen to. He gets into his famous N-word controversy. And sorry to say, he's still doing that propaganda where he tries to convince everyone that he only said it when quoting other people saying it. Which obviously is a lie. Here's a clip from the first ever Joe Rogan podcast. Once, once I get the internet to do it, I'll make it... I'll make it HD so you can see how ugly I am. That is ugly. They forgot to delete that one during Spotify's extensive Operation N-Word cleanup. Yeah, nobody gives a fuck about context. So, I'm not racist, but if I was gonna quote- Oh, Joe, you should have just let this one go. This PR is embarrassing. I'm not a racist. That's what's so insane about this. I thought everybody would understand. But here's the thing about these words. You can't say them. Damn, six years of honing this material and he's got to pad the back half of the special with PR. Oh, that's bad. But he still doesn't stray too far from the gay stuff, as that shadow continues to seep out. I love gay men. Joe's shadow is now in total control and is just leaking all over the place. And now, with the shadow in control here, he's going to steal another joke, this time from Bill Burr. You this thought when you're in your car and the light turns green, but the scooters keep coming, and you just want to go to jail! Uh, I have a lot of fucked up thoughts, man. I do. You ever drive down the street and see like 30 people up on a sidewalk and you just think... <laughs> Now that's at least two stolen jokes in this special, so that's bad. And this is the guy who got famous for calling out Carlos Mencia for stealing jokes. If someone steals a riff from a song, that shit's in the news constantly. Yeah. Motherfuckers steal shit and make it on HBO, it Netflix, and put it on television. Not only did he steal material from Brendan Schaub, but he really just became the new Mencia tonight. I can't believe it. Talk about full circle. The shit hero's journey. So who is going to step up and be the new Joe Rogan to the new Carlos Mencia? I nominate Joe List. Come on, Joe, stand up for comedy. Go after Joe Rogan aggressively, please. I send my wife pictures of other dudes' dicks. This is a, please, Joe, please, we don't need to know this. And as his deepest secrets are spilling out against his will, Joe is fully lactating now, leaking both psychically and physically. San Antonio, I love you to death. Thank you very much. And now it's all over. It's finally done. Six years. And... They really dipped into the budget for this closing credits music, which sounds like it's ripped straight from the Ken Griffey Jr. game for Super Nintendo. Well, I guess if I had one sentence that could sum this thing up, it'd be... I hate dumb people that are confident, you know? Oh. Try again? I hate dumb people that are wrong and confident. And now that that's done, every comic on every podcast is going to spend the next six months raving about how Joe murdered and killed and massacred and chopped up all the bodies into little tiny chunks, threw them in the Austin River, whatever that's called. Laugh out loud. Yeah. Dude, I like it because the, him saying the N-word, so funny, so funny. It said the N-word? Oh, it's so good. Oh. It was so good, man. That's good, that's good. It's so good? Yeah. I and then, and then he was talking about the word retard. They'll kiss the ring for that podcast invite and the cycle of comedy shit will go on and on and on. But like we've discussed here before, everything has its cycle. Joe has completely run out of ideas, and his mind is ruined by social media. It can happen, it can. Joe has never been very good at comedy, but somehow he gets to be the number one guy, the big gatekeeper. He's our era's Johnny Carson, and getting the invite to Joe's podcast is the new bringing you over to the couch or whatever. This special will go down as Joe's last. He's like 60 or 70 years old, and it's clear that his heart isn't in it anymore. This thing was just a greatest hits montage of the worst era of this guy's podcast condensed into an hour. Did you just assume my gender? Every great has their final moments. And sometimes we don't even realize it's a final moment until it's already passed us by. Wayne Gretzky had his final goal. 
his final shift. Michael Jordan, his final dunk. Elvis, his final song. The last time you ever pick up your son, your final summer sunset, and Joe Rogan, his final stool hump. Gotta go back to 2016. We didn't even realize it at the time, but we were witnessing Joe's final stool fucking. Gotta appreciate every moment like it's the last, guys. He didn't mount that thing once during this special. So disappointing. You gotta play the hits, Joe, come on. And now he's this sad Charles Foster Kane figure. All the money in the world and never satisfied. All his decent friends scared away. The only friends he has left just kiss his ass and tell him he's amazing. That's the only explanation for him thinking this was his greatest set of all time leading up to this live stream. No real friend would allow Joe to gringo poppy himself. Now this Netflix thing is getting panned by just about everyone. And despite Joe insisting that he doesn't read comments, it's obvious that he does. And the feedback from this thing is going to wound him deeply. And the weird thing is, he didn't even need to do this. He's got more money than he knows what to do with. He just did this because he still wants people to think he's funny. This guy literally cries when he talks about becoming a stand-up and getting passed at the comedy store. He wants to be a comic so bad, and he's just getting torn apart out there. Who knows what, what kind of bullshit act I would have had if uh, I didn't run into Mitzi, if I didn't get passed at the store. One of the reasons why she passed me is this was a, a trick that we all used to do. I learned from the Todd. He would sit in the back of the room and he was sat next to Mitzi while Mitzi watched me and he would laugh hard. I went up there and I did my set and he laughed really hard. Mitzi just grabbed my arm. She goes, you're really funny. Wow. Okay. I'm calling for spots. You're paid regular. Wow. That was more important to me than any TV show. Like, the TV show was just a lot of money. It was like, like well, I couldn't sleep that night. I was like, I'm a paid regular, like I'm a real comedian. I'm a real comedian, I'm a real comedian. I'm at the store, I'm a real comedian. I'm at the comedy store. I just, dude, I always knew I was going there. It was a religious call, and the comedy store was terrible. And there was all these people that she passed that were like, I'm telling you, talentless. January 6th, lock them up, lock them all up. The sad thing is, despite it being the meaning of life or whatever, Joe's legacy will not be his comedy. He will be remembered as the stool humper who won the entertainment industry lottery then voluntarily let the world collectively watch him go insane on the internet over the course of thousands of hours of podcasting. A cautionary tale of money chasing, Dunning-Kruger, and unreconciled childhood trauma. And now Joe's really painted himself into a corner with this new Guy Texas project of his. And even his new audience has started to turn on him. Now he's truly up a creek, waist deep in the big muddy, because he made the mistake of expressing a political opinion on his podcast, an alleged holy citadel of free speech. Those new fans of his say he endorsed the wrong guy for president and they are pissed. Joe's dusted off and wheeled out his apology podium once again, but it's too late. And now Trump is using his sorcery to turn his guys against Joe, even encouraging UFC fans to start booing him at the next event. Joe's in a bind and it's a beautiful bind. If Trump loses, all these guys are going to blame Joe and actively despise him forever. And if Trump wins, well, he has vowed to seek vengeance on all his critics in the media, which now includes Joe, who will only remain safe as long as his Navy SEAL pals stay loyal. Oh boy, that is bad. The world is leaving Joe behind. And just like Johnny Carson, I expect Joe will also become just a reclusive, depressed, rich guy. Holed up in his own personal Alamo, surrounded by rock-hard retired Navy SEAL guys just snorting HGH and going on popper-fueled social media binges, just like Johnny. And before I go, there was one joke I did enjoy. The funniest way for me to die is if I die from COVID. Okay, yes, it would. An honest bit, and that was actually a good joke. I enjoyed that. But I do have to disagree. It would be much funnier if he was discovered dead and frozen solid inside his famous ice bath just frozen over with nothing but a bit of bald scalp and two rock-hard frozen nipples poking through the ice layer on top. Well, now that Joe's stand-up cycle is finally closed, he'll be sent off to be with the other former greats, who have come and gone in and out of our lives like clouds that wisp together in the summer sky, where they are formed into ephemeral shapes, then blown away. And so we all, too, will blow away. So enjoy it while it lasts, guys. We'll all be gone soon, thank God. 
appreciate each moment like it's your last, because it could be. Thanks for everything, Joe. Thank you for your service. You fought long and hard, very hard. But now it's time to burn the boats. Please stay in your castle and never do comedy again, please. Burn down this shitty Joe Rogan sphere of influence and finally allow the comedy ecosystem to regrow from its ashes. The only thing good that could come out of this special is that it hopefully destroys Joe's comedy ambitions completely and he finally retires. But I do believe him when he says that this was the hardest he's ever worked at anything. This is the guy who couldn't handle more than two weeks of working in construction, the only real job he's ever had, and whose idea of hardship is spending 30 minutes in a sauna. Something regular people do to relax. I give this thing a one out of five. Thanks. And sorry. Gotta go.